Well, thank you very much. I, I feel like I'm a long lost uh, relative who who's crashed in a, in, into a into a um, a uh, family reunion of some of my distant relatives, and <laughs> and uh, and and since our families parted, uh, so we keep the, some of the same words, but they mean different things. And, and so when we come back together, uh, uh, we find that. Um, uh, we have trouble uh, uh, figuring out what, what, what the words mean uh, from, the, from the rest of the family. Uh, you know, and uh, I'm, I'm a, a practicing structural engineer. My colleagues here are, are all structural engineers. Uh, um, Alan is actually a, an engineering professor at, at, uh, at Cambridge. The rest of us are in practice. And, and so um, we've been um, admiring from afar, you know, the work of, you know, of Walter Whiteley, you know, Bob Conley, uh, Bern Schultz, uh, uh, Shlomo uh, Gortner, and, and then we have, uh, luckily we have Simon Guest from Cambridge to occasionally act like a translator, because he, he's, he's a, uh, a structural engineer who, who uh, he collaborates so with, with your, your, your group pretty much. Anyway, so um, th this is, um, um, and I have to say a lot of the work that has come out of the rigidity group is getting a lot of, a lot of traction in, in um, the structural engineering world these days. Uh, particularly in um, in, in uh, Switzerland at EPFL and ETHS Zurich, as well as um, you know, you know Cambridge, you know uh, uh, schools in Belgium and the like, because uh, we're we're uh, using uh, figuring out how to apply some of the, the work that you guys are doing, and using the um, you know the, the the computer power we have now, particularly the graphical power, has, has made it possible, and uh, the um, uh, and and uh, one of the things I want to point out is that as uh, architects and engineers, I'm a uh, I'm in an architectural from an engineering and an architectural uh, practice. Uh, you know, we're very visual people, and, and so a lot of times when we do design, we want to do it visually, and we want to see it, what it is. Uh, you know, not only uh, uh, why is something the answer, uh, what not only what the answer is, but why is it the answer is very important to us. Okay, so. Um, the, um, I'm going to start out with the problem, problem statements, and then I'll come back, I'll restate them at the end of the presentation, but I, I want to throw this out to here at the beginning, uh, just so you can be thinking about it while, while I, I talk about the rest of the things. So here, here's the problem statement. Uh, for a given planar graft, often quad dominant, and I'll explain what I mean by quad dominant in a minute, what vertex positions in the plane achieve the maximum number of planar lifts under the conditions of non-degeneracy. And by that, we mean uh, no faces collapse to lines, no lines collapse to points, and perhaps there's other criteria. And, um, and, the, and for, for us, our understanding is that this is the equivalent to maximizing the number of states of cell stress of the, of the planar graph or maximizing the number of mechanisms or, or flexes. And, uh, and I'll tell you why we care in just a moment. But and at the bottom, you see a, a graph that is kind of a, um, uh, appropriate for this. For that graph, how many lifts, what's the maximum number of lifts you can get in that graph? Uh, we're not sure. We think it's around 17, 18. It could be as few as zero if you did it wrong. Um, you know, uh, uh, one lift is easy. The others you got to think about. And so, uh, but we don't know, um, you know, how, how many there are. And, and so that's an important question. And the second question is, let's say you're not given a topology, but you're just given a boundary. Uh, how would one design a quad dominant planar graph that maximizes the number of lifts for a given convex polygonal boundary that is also held uh, in, a, in a plane in the lift? So that, that uh, hexagonal, that octagonal, uh, polygon down at the bottom is, is held planar, and you want to create a graph inside that boundary that has um, um, uh, mainly uh, quad uh, panels, but you want to have a lot of lifts uh, available, okay? Now, uh, uh, with that, uh, kind of if you could park that in your, in your, um, in your thoughts as we go through the rest of this, we'll, we'll come back to the question, the question at the end. But I, I want to revisit our common ancestors and and uh, let me let me start out with um, you know the ancestors of um, of you know of, of Maxwell. I could go back to Rankin or Ari, but let's go back to to Maxwell. And you know Maxwell uh, wrote these two incredibly important papers, which I've seen referenced many many times in the last couple of days. 
1864, he wrote a paper called On Reciprocal Figures and Diagrams of Forces. Now, Maxwell was highly uh, tied into the engineering world. Uh, he even um, published a paper after this one in an engineering newspaper, basically. Uh, his, uh, the best man at his wedding, and perhaps his best friend, was his cousin, William Dice Kay, who, who, who was, a, was an engineer. And of course, uh, he worked a lot with Rankin, who was referred to earlier, uh, who, who was a professor of civil engineering at, at, at Glasgow. Uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, he, uh, so he talked about reciprocal figures, which we'll talk about a bit, and diagrams of forces, certainly a term in an engineering sense, which, which you got, uh, your world also uses in similar ways. Um, he then wrote another paper, which is, and you need both of these papers to cover different topics. Six years later, uh, it was uh, almost the same title, slightly different, on reciprocal figures, frames, and diagrams of forces. And so the, the term frame here, uh, we would call a truss, okay? A, a series of uh, a bars, a pin connected bars that, that, that have been talked about so, uh, so much. Uh, he also wrote another paper in 1864 with a different title, which I can't quite remember at the moment, which also had the count in there that we'll talk about later. Uh, but, but I think the, uh, the, the one that's most apropos is this particular paper. Uh, and um, so after uh, Maxwell's paper in 1870, two years later, uh, Luigi Cremona, who was a, of course, a mathematician, a, um, a, but also uh, a you know, geometer, but also a civil engineer, he was also an engineer, had, uh, uh, wrote a, a, a book in uh, Italian, which in 1890 was, uh, was, was published again in English on the graphic, graphical statics, two treatises uh, on graphical calculus and reciprocal figures in graphical statics. And then a, a kind of a, a, new, a newer kind of, uh, well, it's contemporary uh, of ours. Um, Chris Calladine wrote a very important paper in uh, 1978 uh, on Buckminster's Fuller's Tensegrity Structures and Clark Maxwell's Rules uh, for the Construction of Stiff Frames. And through it all comes this equation that we've seen many times uh, over this conference, which is uh, in the two-dimensional world, which is what I'm gonna focus on today, uh, two and three, uh, the um, uh, uh, two times the number of vertices minus the number of edges minus three equals the number of mechanisms minus the number of states of cell stress. Or you could also say the number of flexes minus the number of lifts. And, and, and so, you know, there, 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 there's, there's other ways of looking at this. Uh, we know that M and S, at least I believe M and S are, have to be either zero or whole uh, positive integers. And so if you increase the number of, of flexes, you have to increase the number of states of cell stress or the number of lifts. And so, you know, that, that's very, very key to us. Now, uh, let me talk, uh, let me uh, borrow from, uh, uh, from your world a little bit. Here we have uh, figure A is a graph, okay? It has one state of cell stress. And, and because it is a, uh, and it's a planar graph, I mean, you can untangle it. Uh, so if a planar graph has a state of cell stress, one can lift the graph to form a 3D plain face polyhedron. So you can see how uh, in figure B here, how that, uh, that two-dimensional uh, uh, drawing uh, draft has been lifted to a three-dimensional plain face uh, polyhedron. That polyhedron has meaning in physics is what we call the airy stress function. And you, can, and you can show through engineering mechanics that the change in slope from one face to the other is proportional to the force uh, in the state of cell stress below. And, and this is a fairly straightforward engineering proof. Uh, and um, so each literally independent lifting or how many different plain face polyhedron can one graph make, each linearly independent lifting represents a inner, linearly independent state of cell stress. Uh, which we want. Now this uh, diagram only has one lifting. Uh, so therefore it only has one state of cell stress. Now uh, uh, we've talked a lot about going from 2D to 3D and, uh, and, and the mapping. And so here uh, we, we just talked about on the lower left, we have a two-dimensional graph, which uh, in our world, we would call the form diagram. It is, 
it is a two-dimensional diagram of a structural system with uh, bars, bars and nodes, or, or, or as you say, edges and vertices, which is then lifted to, to form this uh, uh, plane-faced uh, three-dimensional polyhedron, which through a very simple equation with a fairly sophisticated thought but by Maxwell, every node in the um, polyhedron on the left can map to a face on the polyhedron on the right, every face maps to a node and every edge has an another edge. And because of the very simple e equations that Maxwell gave us, you can then project it back down to the plane and it will turn out that this two-dimensional diagram on the right is, is a reciprocal of the one on the left. Uh, depending if you do the way Maxwell did it or the way the Cremona did it, if you did it Maxwell's ways, every, every line on the left has a reciprocal line on the right, which is perpendicular to it. Uh, Cremona would, would tell you how to do it parallel. Um, and um, and it, it turns out if the one on the left is a structure, uh, the, 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 uh, the length of the, of the reciprocal line on the other diagram uh, is equal to the force. You know, from an engineering point of view, this is kind of like magic, all right? Uh, that that you, know, you can have a, a graphical representation of the force uh, in the, of the structure on the left uh, through this, uh, th through this uh, reciprocity, this uh, pro projective uh, reciprocity. Uh, now, so here uh, is our, our two diagrams, two graphs that are reciprocal to each other. And what's remarkable is they're also not only uh, related to, from the point of view of forces, but also from the point of view of rigidity. So on, your, on the left, later I'm going to be talking about grid shells, but on the, on the one on the left, you can imagine this is like a, 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 a spider web that's been stretched out, okay? And you're looking at a, it's in, it's in a two-dimensional plane. And, and on the right, uh, I think on this one, we have a, 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 a Cremona mapping. Uh, um, so uh, so uh, every line on the left has a parallel line on the right, and the length of the line on the right is the force of the member on the left. Okay, and, uh, and if, well, let me go back to this uh, diagram. If the structure, um, if this system had multiple liftings, for one uh, structure, uh, one diagram on the left, you could have multiple diagrams on the right because every separate lifting will be a different diagram, a different set of forces uh, in, in your structure. So if, if you have a structure that has multiple liftings, it will have multiple reciprocals that, that map back to the original um, uh, graph. Okay, so, so uh, here is, uh, uh, on the one on the left, it, it has, uh, so these are reciprocal graphs uh, the, the, the graph on the left has 152 bars. The one on the right has 152 bars. The one on the left has 80 vertices. Uh, the one on the right has 80 faces uh, because they're, uh, the one on the left has uh, 74 faces or polygons. The one on the right has 74 vertices because uh, these are projections of reciprocal polyhedrons. And if you, if you do the Maxwell count, you, the one on the left has a value of plus five. The one on the right has a value of minus seven. And, and from Kaladine's work, we know that that number is equal to the number of mechanisms minus the number of states of cell stress. And uh, because they're both projections of, uh, of uh, reciprocal polyhedron, we know from Euler's count of, of, of simple polyhedrons that, that these things will always add to minus two. Now, I, a really quite remarkable thing, to, at least to me remarkable, is that it turns out that um, if you add the number of mechanisms and sale, states of cell stress for each diagram, you will get uh, the same number. Above, it's about differences, but here it's about summations. So if I take the number of mechanisms plus the number of states of cell stress on, on the left, it is equal to the number of mechanisms plus the number of states of cell stress on the right. And therefore you end up with this kind of remarkable thing that the number of states of cell stress on the left is equal to the number of mechanisms on the right plus one. And, uh, 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 and 
And so, uh, as you know from the title, we're going to try to figure out how to get the maximum number of states of cell stress on this figure on the left. We know it has at least one because we that's how we laid it out. But could it have three? If so, where do you put the vertice? First of all, how do you figure that out? Uh, how do you reliably from the from the topology know how many? What's the maximum number number you can get? And number two. How do you make that happen? Where do you put the vertices uh, so that this is true without getting a degenerate case? Perhaps one way to do it is to increase the number of mechanisms on the right. So we want to point out that there's, there's, you know, uh, you can fix the problem by fixing the one on the left, or you can fix the problem by by messing with the the, the graph on the right. Um, and uh, and so I just we want to uh, put that out there. But you know, the whole this whole rigidity of graphs uh, is very important. Okay. Why do I care? <laughs> uh, well, uh, we design a lot of things which we, uh, we call grid shells, our roofs, our skylights. Uh, here's a really nice one. It's not one of mine. This was done by, uh, by the engineer Venner Zobeck uh, and Helmut Janis down at the University of, Chicago, University of Chicago. It's over the library. But a grid shell is a collection. And if you look at the picture here, you see if you look past the glass, you can see a bunch of um, of bars that go around each of the faces. And so a grid shell is a collection of rigid bars in three space, which approximates a surface. The projection of a grid shell is a planar graph. So if you took this grid shell and you, and you projected it down onto the XY plane, you have a two dimensional graph. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Because if that grid shell in three dimensions is in equilibrium, it has forces in all the members, then the projection also is in equilibrium, as Walter Poincaré Rankin observed uh, uh, in, in the uh, 1860s. And so uh, 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 sometimes we like to make ourselves simpler. So maybe we design the two-dimensional shadow. So we, the last uh, speaker spoke, spoke, talked about the shadow of, of her structure. So if you look straight down on the on this on this roof, you will see a two-dimensional graph. That, that still has forces in it. It's, it still has states of cell stress. But also what's interesting, you no longer see gravity. You no longer see the vertical forces or the vertical reactions. You just see the horizontal forces and the horizontal states of cell stress. Uh, and, and so you know the, the forces on, on this load, which we're gonna say are gravity-like, uh, um, are, are resisted by the edges of each of these, um, each of these faces by axial loads, which is good because it's a very efficient way to, to resist loads. But if that's not possible, you do it by bending. So each of those members have to be bent or flexed uh, in order to resist the forces. And that's not so good because it's much less efficient use of material. So uh, we want to maximize how many, uh, how many uh, uh, load cases can we re resist with just purely axle? And the number of load cases is, inter is equal to the number of internal vertices. You, know, you could have a person stand on each of these nodes one at a time, and each of those is an independent load case. Okay? And so uh, uh, each linearly independent uh, state of cell stress or each linearly independent planar lift represents a vertical loading case that the grid shell can resist in just purely axial forces without bending. And so, uh, so uh, here, here's another um, uh, uh, roof that- uh, can, I, um, <clears throat> can I just ask a question? So- Sure. Okay, so, so by axial force, you mean just straight down the, the bar basically? Yep, yeah, j j just okay. a pure compression. And so uh, by bending, do you mean that the, the bar bends or a twist between faces basically? I, I mean the bar, the bar bends. If you look at my picture, I'm kind of bending my pen here. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, you know, bending is not good because okay. uh, uh, not all the material is used. But if you just pu push straight and axial, the entire cross section is, is activated, and that's that's the most most efficient, most efficient. Okay. Got it. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, and so um, uh, so uh, so you, you, uh, now the grid shell itself may or may not be planar. Okay. Sometimes you cannot, uh, for various technical reasons, you cannot get exactly flat faces. It's better if they are, it's cheaper to build. Uh, but uh, plan planarity of the grid shell itself is desirable, but not always necessary. Uh, now, what, what are the ones I've shown you have what are, are convex shapes, which are generally all in compression. 
but that's not always true. Uh, either if you look at the, uh, for instance, the uh, the roof of the Great Court at the British Museum, there's a lot of tension in some of the elements. So sometimes uh, we uh, um, the uh, the liftings that we're looking at are not just a bunch of ridges. Sometimes they're ridges and valleys. Okay, what the heck is a quad dominant grid shell? Okay, this is an example of one. A quad dominant grid shell is a graph that, that consists mainly of quads. These quads are often regular in shape. And this has to do with just economics. Uh, one can imagine that if you, um, if, you, if you have a quad panel, you can, you know, glass or whatever comes in rectangular pieces and you can, cu you can cut out a, a, a a quad shape out of a rectangular piece of glass at, at you know reasonable price. If you have triangular glass, you generally when you you start with with quadrilateral or rectangular pieces of glass, and you have to throw half of it away. So triangular faces are much more expensive. Another advantage of, of a quad mesh is that you have a four valent node, and the reason advantage is that is that. Uh, you don't have, uh, going to the question that we just had, you don't have, uh, you, sometimes you can avoid twisted joints. So, so if you have a four valent node, uh, you, you generally you're, you have a much cleaner construction. Uh, if you have uh, more than four valents, uh, one of the members may come into the joint um, you know, because you can't, you can't resolve it, okay? Uh, the um, now in order to achieve this in, in the real world, you're not going to be able to do all all uh, quads, particularly if your if your boundary of your roof is flat, a uh, plane, and so you you are going to have to have some triangles. Those will be a, a bit more expensive, more de detailed to difficult to detail or draw, uh, but you need some of them, but as few as you can, and, and you also may end up with some pentagon hexagons or octagons. Uh, uh, you know those are okay, but just not too many of them. Okay, so uh, some of the, let me give you some more uh, gradation to the question here. Uh, we want to maximize the number of states of self stress. We want to maximize the number of planar lifts because that will maximize the number of load combinations that the engineers can use uh, in the grid shelter that can be resisted with only axial forces. Um, it, it is nice if the states of self stress are well distributed i.e. that there's a force in each edge member. Uh, each bar has a force in it from at least one state of cell stress and preferably from more than one state of cell stress, you know, because if you have um, more, the more states of cell stress, the more load combination you can do. Now you will have some small edge members adjacent to the perimeter that may have zero forces. If you look at this diagram here, uh, you'll see that there's a, next to this edge on the left-hand side, there's a series of very short members that are approximately perpendicular to the edge, those will have zero force. So ignore those, they, they're allowed to break the rule. But every other member out there, you want to have uh, a, a state of cell stress that puts a force in it. Because if it doesn't have a force in the two dimensions, it will not have any force, uh, axial force in the three dimensions. Uh, just a, a, a fine grain size. Uh, to have a reasonable panel size. If you if we end up with a bunch of really big quads, we got to subdivide them with a, a members that have to act in bending. Okay, so it's nice to have a a uh, a fine grain symmetry, anti symmetry. Okay, this is a um, these are very helpful concepts in structural engineering, and so it's nice to have a symmetrical state of cell stress or planar lifts. That that is desirable because it helps the grid shell resist uniform loads such as self-weight or uniform snow. Um, in the last few weeks here, we've had about a meter of snow in Chicago uh, but without, a, without a melt. And so you know, some of the roofs around town had some pretty good sized uniform load on it, didn't drift much, uh, that uh, is finally starting to melt off here. Uh, now, but also you can have, uh, uh, it's nice to also, if you can, have anti-symmetrical states of cell stress, stress or anti-symmetrical planar lifts. That's also desirable because it helps the grid shell resist anti-symmetrical loads, such as a wind load or a snow, a snow drift. Let's say you had a bunch of snow on half your roof 
and uh, and no snow on the other. That's that's uh, this will help. Now, getting anti-symmetrical lifts are often quite difficult and not achievable. The symmetrical lift is usually uh, achievable and, and, and highly desirable. Uh, I'm going to give you a very simple example. So uh, here on the left is a um, uh, is a graph that has uh, um, 16 bars or edges. Uh, we sometimes we use B for bars, but so 16 edges, nine vertices, nine faces. It has a maximal count of minus one. So the number of mechanisms minus the number of states, the cell starts is minus one. Uh, this is uh, a bit tortured enough that it has no mechanisms uh, and only has one state of cell stress. And it's not a very good one because it's only the center pyramid, if you will, that this, uh, I don't know what, uh, this, this five noted graph here in the middle is, is the one state of cell stress and it can't even reach out to the edge. Uh, so if you move the geometry a little bit, oh, by the way, um, uh, this roof, if this were a projection of roof, could, would have a, a uh, the size of the load space this, uh, would be five because you have five nodes here in the middle, one, two, three, four, five. So you could stand on each one of these nodes one at a time on the roof and put a load. So you have five independent, uh, but you but only one of those families of load cases can be resisted by axial load because it only has one reciprocal diagram. Now, if, you, um, if you move the nodes around, you pick up a mechanism, but you also pick up a state of cell stress, which is helpful. So now uh, we have two uh, of, the, of the family of, of five potential um, load vectors, if you will. Uh, we can handle two of them with purely axial force and only three have to be handled by bending. And, and generally um, there will be certain dominant load cases on a roof. And so those are the ones you've got to be, you want to be pretty sure you're, you're handling just axially and some of the, um, the more uh, incidental load cases which aren't really activated by nature, um, you can deal with bending. Uh, so with that as kind of the background, let me go back to where I began with the problem statement. So I'm almost to the end here. Uh, you know, I've been uh, sailing along here pretty fast. So I, I'm gonna show two slides on this question and then two slides on the next question then we can come back to it. For a given planar graph, often quad dominant, now you know what I mean by that, what vertex positions in the plane achieve the maximum number of planar lifts under the conditions of non-degeneracy, which we have defined, which maybe you can do a better definition, no faces collapse to lines, no lines uh, collapsed to points. So basically this topology, where can you put the nodes to get, get, get the most? And, and, uh, and, there's, and that kind of relates to these kind of sub questions. For, for a given topology, is it known? Do, do, does your world know how to determine the maximum number of achievable states of, of self-stress? Uh, self you know, how many planar lifts could you get out of a, if someone gave you a topology? And then the next question is, okay, now you know, say you can achieve, you can achieve 18 of them or 20 for this particular um, uh, graph. Uh, is it known how to find the vertex positions uh, in the plane to achieve the maximum number of states of, of self-stress or plane lift? So number is the first question, how many are there? Number two, how do you find them? Um, uh, for the problem two, uh, you know, where, you, where we give you a, a boundary, you know, your, your client hires you and they say, I, I need a skylight or I need a roof or this is a stadium, this is the, the boundary of my roof. Uh, how would one design a quad dominant planar graph that maximizes the number of lifts for a given uh, convex polygonal boundary, which is also held in the plane? And, um, and kind of related question to that is, you know, one I just kind of said, you know, how can you create those topologies? And, and one of the questions we have as designers, can you give us a menu? Are, are there subgraphs, primitives that, we, that can, can be combined to make topologies with a large number of uh, states of cell stress? Do we, do we start adding um, um, the Desart diagrams together? Do we have little, what we call wedding cakes or little pyramids that we, that we sprinkle in and add together in such a way that uh, the, you're adding the, these primitives, these subgraphs together to, to create a, a graph that, that does that. And so, uh, so now I, I have both any questions and from my point of view, even more importantly, do you have any answers? Okay. 
Well, one question I have is um, how, uh, suppose you, uh, somebody looks at one of your questions and says, here's a configuration that'll do it for you. I've just run my computer for 20 hours and we found these particular locations with these particular points. Would that be helpful to you? Uh, in a certain sense, it's helpful, but it's really not what we want. You know, we're, we're designers. <laughs> uh, we want to be in control. We want to know, for us, uh, the, the um, why something is the answer is much more important than what the answer is. Because if we understand why that's the answer, we can then maybe change the problem. Uh, but one of the ideas is to uh, find a stress in order to, and let the stress find the configuration. But even then, you have to have a very special stress to find a special configuration with more lips. Yeah, and, and the fact is, you know, how do you, you know, uh, it's easy to find a one lift or a one state of cell stress. Right. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, how do you get two? How do you get three? You know, uh, let me, um, let me uh, go back to, um, and um, I'm not seeing that the, the, the uh, if it, uh, the chat so well. So if anybody has a question, just kind of unmute yourself and and, and reach. Yeah, so one idea is to take the uh, polyhedral lift and then look at the facets. Maybe you have an octahedral facet or maybe even quad facets. And then on top of those facets, you put another polyhedra and so on. Like you were saying about quad lifts. But you could do it with other sizes too, like octahedral or hexagonal or even pentagonal. Uh, mm -hmm. That you put you put one down with these, uh, say, big or maybe not so big uh, regions that have these flat lifts, and then on top of those you put another one. Now the yeah. stress is localized to that first um, uh, what do you call it? The first uh, facet of the thing. You put facets on top of facets like that. You, you know, that, that's certainly possible. Uh, for, for instance, in, in this graph on the left, if one filled in the oculus with some kind of um, state of cell stress, yeah. uh, you know, that subset could then span to, the, uh, to the, the oculus edge you see now, which could then carry the load to the perimeter. So, yeah. so yes, having, um, and you know, that's one that we're kind of calling like a wedding cake. Uh, yeah. Where, yeah, exactly. Where, where, where you have a... Um, where you have a graph inside a graph inside a graph, uh, you know. So that, yeah, that not be... not all stresses. There are things where you have to adjust the two. There's one on one side and another on the other side, and you might even put something you want it to be convex. There might be something that's concave, but you put them together to erase an edge. That's also possible. Hmm. Uh, yeah. you, you know, the the one on the left here, you know. Uh, which uh, you know, uh, I've shown to, showed to Bob a few times, uh, and, and, and Shlomo have, have, have taken a stab at it. Uh, you, you know, the, the the one on the left has uh, definitely one state of cell stress. Uh, we engineers think that there's two more out there, but we can't find them. Okay, uh, we suspect that it has two more, but we don't know how to prove that there are or there aren't by the topology. And then if they if they do exist, how do we find them? And uh, that would be very helpful to us. How do you, uh, what makes you think there are two others? Uh, just because of the, the way we did our accounting, uh, you know, um, uh, given that each of these has to be um, a plain face, a lot of times what we'll do is we will start with one polygon or one, yeah, one polygon. So we start with this corner polygon and we, and we fix the Z coordinates of these three red nodes, which of course told us the Z coordinate of this last one. And, and then we add it, um, uh, one more here, uh, so that so the, the first three is like the, the minus three in Maxwell's count. So the first three just gets you fixed in space. Now, if you if you find one more point, that tells you you have one more state of cell stress, and, and so so this uh, lifts this uh, this face, uh, and so we know so we now know where this node is, but we don't know where any other nodes are. Uh, and then uh, we lift this one and it gives us some more, more of the faces, but then we, then it kind of dies out. And then we lift this last one <laughs> and, and, and we know, we now know the, um, uh, the, uh, the Z coordinate of every node by, by definition. Okay. Uh, but having said that, 
uh, these other subsequent lifts have conflicts. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, when, when you come back around, they kind of run into themselves. And so uh, we're, we're trying to figure out, is there a place to, where we can move all the vertices to, to a place that allows us to achieve what we think are these two extra states of cell stress? There's also another condition that uh, you could look for, especially with the degree four vertices. Uh, it can happen. So if there is a lift, there's some way of adjusting the stresses so a, uh, a stress disappears on at least one of the uh, edges, right? You just add the two stresses, subtract one from the other. In fact, you can kill any one of them, but if you want them to be a po positive thing. So what you could do is um, look at each of these things and say, well, if this edge uh, goes to zero, so do a bunch of others. Sure. And so you would have necessary conditions for the thing to have another lift. Mm -hmm. And so, I don't know, would that be helpful that you could say, well, you drew that picture, tough luck, you only got one. Well, it, it, it's good to know, uh, particularly if it's topological, you know, if, if, the gra if the fundamental graph itself is just, uh, you're stuck, you know, no matter what you do, you only get one lift. Um, it'd be good to know that. Uh, well, this wouldn't be topological. You'd have to look at the structure of each okay. of the degree four things, where there's, if there's three pointing one side and one on the other, if that one on the other disappears, the other three disappear too. And then you can work your way through the whole graph. Yeah. So you yeah, at least have to avoid that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, every degree three vertex is, is going to be sort of a, a, a source for this sort of game where you can start to play it. Right? If you could right. throw up one of those edges and then that infects everything. So if the if you're going to have several lifts, they, they have to be to some extent localized to avoid that. Yeah, even if you have a degree four lift, some right. of the, it, it can turn out that some of the edges can't uh, disappear. They can't mm -hmm. zero out. They can't zero out. So the example he showed had had a lift, but the lift was actually localized to a, a, a small place. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, you know, uh, and, and going to, to question two, if we were to, to, uh, in the design mode, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, question one is how do I take a graph and and massage it so that I get get more lifts out of it. The other one is how do I do I if I if you, if if you were able to show me that if I added two members, I picked up. Um, you know, four lifts. I'd be. A, I. I might w w very well spend that money. Uh, well, do you Do you mind if there are a few triangles lying lying around? No, that, that that's okay. I mean, I, I got a bunch of triangles around the Oculus on this one. Yeah. 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 And um, and so um, you know, those are, um, you know, so those are kind of okay. Uh, you know, I mean, a, a limited number is okay. Um, strategically placed. Uh, <laughs> so if, if um, and, I, and I can't tell uh, all of you on, the, on, on you know, how much uh, the work that um, has been done by, by in the rigidity world is, is, is becoming very, very useful in the structural engineering world. Uh, you know, a lot of the, um, like I say, you know, everyone's, uh, you know, um, if the engine, structural engineers knew what you guys know, <laughs> uh, I think we would find it uh, very useful. And the things that we have found that we've been able to understand, which is uh, we, we do get stuck pretty quick because the terminology is very different um, that, um, y you know, uh, but the things that we do understand, we have we've been able to apply to actually actual buildings. So Bill, a lot of your structures have symmetry. Um, how important is this symmetry? Uh, would it make sense to look for a maximum number of states of self-stress within a certain symmetry class? Or do you, uh, would you not consider that a reasonable? Uh, symmetry, symmetry often happens, uh, you know, like uh, this one ha has, you know, it's, it's has uh, a symmetry around the, 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 the middle, you know, the left is equal to the right, or mirror uh, symmetry. Uh, this one has a, a symmetry in a, in, in, in a couple of directions. Uh, and so a lot of times in architecture, that'll happen naturally. You'll have some kind of symmetry uh, just because of the opening, you, you know, the, 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 the winter garden you're trying to skin uh, will let it to, but sometimes they're not. 
Okay. So, uh, you know, if there was a, a, a family of solutions for symmetrical problems, that'd be very useful. But, but it'd also be nice to know if you, for those, and that'll carry, carry, cover many, many cases. Uh, for, for, for cases where, for various reasons, you, you can't have symmetry at the boundary. Uh, so therefore you can't have symmetry, um, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the grid. Uh, those do happen. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about this one is, um, and, and this has come up a bit in the, in the conversation with Shlomo and, 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 and Bob, is that uh, these eight nodes are actually on one, <laughs> they're supposed to be <laughs> on one plane. Uh, because uh, if that's true, then the roof does not kick against the, the, the adjacent building. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so be, because uh, if, if this bottom, if, if, if we're looking down on a lifting and that lifting has a warped bottom, structurally that means I'm kicking against my building. And, and so the, the, the building around this thing would have to be able to resist the, the thrust from the roof. But, but, but if I'm able to have a lifting where the, where the where the perimeter polygon is held planar, it is a kind of like, it's like a self-tied arch uh, where, where, you, um, uh, where you can, um, where it, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, uh, resolves, it resolves itself. Um, and uh, let me, um, let me, uh, uh, if you look at the, my background on my picture right now, oh. okay. Uh, th this is a building I designed in London, uh, which is a tied arch. And so it's self-tied, you know, the, the arch is at Liverpool Street Station. So the, the arch itself um, uh, kicks, uh, doesn't have to kick against the abutment, it's tied by the, the, by the, the steel at the, at the bottom of the, of the arch, where the arch hits the abutment. And, and, and because of that, the, uh, you know, so uh, the moral equivalent of that uh, is is that um, is what I've just said uh, on a uh, on a structure such as what we're looking at uh, here is that uh, it'll act the same. It will not kick against the surrounding if that outside polygon is held planar in the lift. So there's a there's a remark in the chat which is actually quite pertinent, but and that is it regards. So to what extent do you care about the pattern of signs in these stresses? Do you care uh, at all? Yeah, we, we do care. Uh, we generally want as much compression as we, uh, more, uh, as many ridges as possible and a few, a few valleys, okay? And, you want and, a few valleys and, yeah. okay, make sense. So, so uh, uh, as, uh, mostly ridges in, in the lifting, uh, but if you need a few valleys, that's okay. And, and well, let me take that back. Um, for for the primary load case, we like to have ridges, but for the uh, for the sub load cases, valleys are okay. So you could you could have your compression and tension, and sometimes uh, it, it's 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 a good thing, it's a necessary thing, uh, in order to um, to um, uh, handle some some of the um, say sub load cases or or, or, or sub uh, so sub thrust, um, and um, it, it is <laughs> there's there's a whole lot of uh, I don't know if you guys are at all into the world of isotropic geometry that the Austrians are doing, uh, where, where, they're, where they're looking at um, uh, they're looking at a, a special projection, just a, a straight down. They call it isotropic geometry, and 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 so it turns out if if you look at um, uh, uh, you know it turns it turns Gaussian curvature into a more simple form. Mm -hmm. um, there's isotropic Gaussian curvature, which is totally related to uh, to this stuff. This, this, uh, li these liftings. Anyway, it turns out the energy in the roof is equal to the length of the edge of the area stress function times the change in slope. So the energy in, a, in the edge of a member is the force times the length. That is equal to the length of the edge of the area times the, the, the change in angle. And so if, if for the primary load case, you, you have a minima, minimization of the of the lengths times the change of angles. If that's a minimum. That'll be a minimum load path structure. But that's that's 
th th that's like stage two. Let's just get a roof that works. <laughs> is, it, is it true that the, the these roofs, when you make them, that they're heavily they, are they pre-stressed, like pre-stressed concrete? So they're actually having already a lot of stress built in on these. Uh... No, no the, 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 the the stress comes from the weight. Uh, you you have a geometry that this three dimensional geometry that if you if you physically took this roof and you smashed it to the to the x y plane it'd be full of stresses mm -hmm. you know that that's what what this, this these liftings is but but what happens in the three dimensions the loads that are the, the vertical loads that are resisted uh, by your roof uh, show up in a combination of uh, of, well, of forces and all the members, and, and these forces and the members will have a vertical component, but they also have a horizontal component. And, and um, when we look straight down, we only see the horizontal component and we no longer see the vertical load at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one, one little thing for the planar graphs. I, I think we have discovered the, the hard way that rigidity and planarity don't have much to do with each other. But for in particular for those reciprocal diagrams, it's nice to start out with a dependent set, sort of, for example, the tetrahedron, right? This is a simplest case. But then if you you know that there's a self-stress that is no zero, non-zero on every edge. And it's a planar yeah. graph, so that's all right. Mm -hmm. But then if you take the dual, the Maxwell dual, right? That's also exactly one of those minimally stressed sets, sure. because that uh, the duality there goes much nicer in terms of vertices, faces, and edges, because then the vertices go into the faces and the numbers stay the same. Mm -hmm. So I, one of the, so in, in terms of minimally dependent set, they go into minimally dependent sets in that reciprocal figure. Mm -hmm. So uh, and. That is sort of an interesting thing. And the other thing is since rigidity and um, planarity have very little to do with each other, you could take one of the large minimally dependent sets and just draw it uh, in a generic position. And wherever the edges cross, you insert a vertex of degree four, doesn't matter, right? So you get then uh, a lot of vertices of degree four it dualizes into one of your quadrangle uh, dominant objects, right? And it has a nowhere zero self-stress. You're sure about that, right? And then if it's in special position, it probably has more self-stresses. Or as Walter pointed out, right? You could overlay some of these. But I think that's sort of using the reciprocal figures in, in a sophisticated way. Well, I mean, the reciprocal figures are, are hugely uh, informative to us as engineers. And uh, I, I know some of my colleagues are, are, are on the line too, if they want to join in. Uh, but um, the, um, I, you know, you end up, um, you see things, it's, it's almost like <laughs> a little silly, but like magic glasses, okay? Uh, you, you know, you, you end up, um, uh, to, to uh, like uh, you know, architects and engin structural engineers tend to be very visual people, uh, and and when I when I look at this and I and I can visually see the forces, I can say, well, that's you know, if I look at th this line on the left, and I know through the mapping that that the force in this member is the length of this line, I can say, well, that's a pretty big force, but I can also see that all of these members in this fan here on the right are about the same length. So therefore I have a fairly uniform force distribution on this edge or, or, or fairly uniform size, size of the members. Uh, so, so, cause I'm probably not gonna change the size of the member at each joint or they're gonna be the be similar size. And, and, and if the length of the lines are somewhat equal that means it works. I have a happy, if I, if I had a really long line next to a really short line, I'm gonna have problems. Uh, you, you know, I have a really big member next to a really small member. Um, and and uh, which is uh, difficult to, to deal with. And, and you're, you're going back to your tetrahedron and on your tetrahedron to, it goes to a tetrahedron. Uh, you, you know, basically uh, in both cases, your, your count is, is minus one. Uh, exactly, on, so I'm just saying that these, uh, with the count of minus one, they dualize in, into each other, mm -hmm. which is sort of a, a nice thing because then the forces in one are the 
So they are more or less the same thing. Sure. And they are large. So you can start out with a, as large a graph you want with um, two times the number of vertices minus two counts such that no subgraph violates that. And it will nicely dualize into something. And uh, you draw it in the plane, wherever the edges cross, you insert a vertex of degree four and its dual will have a lot of quadrilaterals, but they, the, the fact that they are minimally dependent will not change. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the whole thing, you know, uh, the, you know, the primitives I talked about early, earlier, you know, so, you know, is it, do I, do I design by just adding a bunch of tetrahedrons that I then do edge splitting on? No, but I, uh, I say you, you should design these other primitives, right? So they are much more interesting primitives. Would yeah. have a lot of quadrilaterals right there, so right? The self strike that is nowhere zero on any edge. If, if you do what uh, Brigitte is suggesting, won't the, uh, uh, qu the quads be uh, parallelograms? I don't know. No, no they're not the, necessarily. I don't just see why. Yes, yes. They, they cross at right uh, across at right angles, so this guy is parallel to that guy. Yes, they'll be parallelograms. The, the, uh, Not that that's bad, but, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Um, if 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 you've already got the pattern of forces and it takes you across the edges, right? Then then and you're you kept the, the stress, then they will be parallelograms because you're not moving the vertex. There's not a generic game. But I, I take the dual later. Uh, you know, uh, one of the things that we're we're interested in is. Uh, what, what we've uh, we found uh, there's a class of structures out there. Another topic called uh, Mitchell trusses, and it turns out Mitchells, uh, which are minimum low pass uh, trusses, and it turns out that there there is a very small set of primitives that make up Mitchell trusses: a bicycle wheel, a, a logarithmic spiral, uh, and uh, a, a orthogonal grid, and, and and things that are closely related to that. And so my, my question to the, to the group here is, is if, if, you, if you looked, if you were gonna build up something with a whole lot of states of cell stress, and, um, but, but with quads, you know, with, with, with not a bunch of triangles, uh, is there a limited vocabulary of members of systems? Like you, you, add, you add uh, tetrahedrons to, uh, uh, to, to Zards and, and, um, and, and, and that's the menu, or are there other menus or other uh, um, squares inside squares uh, that, um, you, that, you know, is there a, I, I, I'd be very interested to know if there's like a, a, a finite number of um, primitives that, that, that could add to something like this. Well, you can do that when you, when you place a tetrahedron on top of a facet of another tetrahedron. Yeah, that's that's one. Your your wedding cake is essentially mm -hmm. one of those, right? But that's only. But that's not everything. Yeah, right. I mean, um, the the um, let's see where I had it there. Can't remember where my slide was. Um, let me see where's that slide. Okay. Uh, you know, if I put this, uh, if I got rid of that, that uh, I guess basically I have a, a, um, a uh, this little pyramid in the middle. If if I got rid of the pyramid and just put a square inside a square inside a square inside a square, and they were uh, concentric in a certain sense, you know, I would have multiple states of cell stress nested inside each other. But I end up with these really big quads on the side, uh, which which don't don't satisfy my um, my um, my desire for a fine grain. Uh, but you know, can put quads in inside those quads too. As long as I have forces in them. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah, you can do uh, that. Yeah. Uh, you, you, there's, the, you, you know, the uh, outside uh, forces, those four verses, they don't have to come to a, a point in the middle. They come to two points. And then the points in that point in the middle has to, and the two uh, edges that go to it, they have to uh, uh, sit 
on uh, yeah. those three lines have to come to a point. Come to a point, yeah. Uh, again, so you have to be very careful about how you arrange them. Mm -hmm. Even if you put, even if you design the stresses first, you have to be very careful about how you arrange the stresses so that the inner one gives you an extra stress. The one on the right can give you an extra stress if you're careful mm -hmm. about how you arrange the stresses and the configuration. You can't yeah. arbitrarily arrange the configuration and you can't arbitrarily arrange the stresses. Mm -hmm. I think that's okay as long as we know the rules. So, you know. No, no, just... the rules are, ger at least for, for quads, it's ger very geometric. You know, lines mm -hmm. have to come to a point and so on if you choose them in the right order. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, and that's what we uh, we try to do here. The one on the left, you know, they don't they don't follow your rules. So on the one on the, the diagram on the left here, the um, you know the uh, there is no f stress in the outside square where the diagram right. is going from the inside um, to the outside. Yeah. But in the one on the right, it does. It looks like all yes. four come to a point, but you don't have to be that uh, rigorous. Yeah, yeah. I don't think I think they actually they they did uh, they kind of. Based, based on our conversations with you, they actually do slightly miss the- uh, oh, uh, oh, I see. Uh, I think that's true. I think like this comes to a point here and this one, uh, yeah, it comes to maybe a point. These it, ones come to a point. Yeah, and then- oh, These yeah, do come yeah, to a point? Yeah, then, yeah. then okay. the, the right, upper part of the square, the lower part of the square and that line in the middle have to all uh, come to a point. Those three lines have to come to a point. Yeah. Uh, Cam, do you have any questions? Not really. I, I mean, there's lots of interesting points being thrown about. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Cam's one of my co-conspirators. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, one of the other things I, I would maybe point out is um, one of the things we can do, Bill talked a bit about uh, self-tied grid shells, where the outside edge is planar. One of the things that often can happen is if we allow the grid shell to kick against the surroundings so um let's say you're you're building it a bit like the roof you uh, bill showed earlier where it can kind of kick against the grounds because it's a roof on the grounds something like that this means that all the nodes around the edge can take a horizontal load so it doesn't have to be self-tied and this we represent within this kind of field by just adding another like extending the graph so mm -hmm. that there's a triangulated yes. bit yes. around the edge. Yeah. So some problems, uh, depending on whether you want them self-tied or not, will have a fully triangulated exterior edge. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, for now, uh, if we uh, if we limit ourselves to ones that don't kick uh, against against the perimeter, uh, it's very similar to the Great Court roof. Uh, which uh, I think uh, at, the, at the British uh, Museum, many of you, I'm sure, have been there and seen it. Uh, that was, um, I don't have an image of it. Maybe, uh, yeah, Cam, do you have an image available that you could pull up if I stop sharing for a second? Yeah, or, I'll get it in a minute. Uh, or uh, I'll tell you what, let me, just, let me just look for it real quick here. Uh, the, um, um, uh, hold on here. Let me do a little search. Um, the um, okay. I've got it. If you want, um, you know, if you I want think, to show it, I think I got it here. Okay. Um, let me know. Do you, do you guys see the Great Cart roof now? <laughs> <laughs> you've got the, you've got the one with the crazy airy function, Bill. I do. Uh, uh, do oh no, sorry, I've got that one. <laughs> okay. Do, 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 do you see my screen, uh, uh, Bob? Yes. Yes. Okay. See, here's the Great Court roof, and, and it, it was it was between some very old um, uh, masonry buildings that could not take any lateral kick, <laughs> and, and so this roof. It can be self-tied, where where because of the, um, the you know the graph, 
it, it has the opportunity to take only vertical supports at the edge and not have to push against either the uh, the round reading room in the middle of the great court uh, or the um, or the or the or the or the surrounding building. So it's it's a you know, it's really quite um, quite an interesting uh, problem. So, so can I ask? Because um, it's probably just a language thing, or maybe I'm a little <laughs> slow. So, so essentially, you have a, a polygonal boundary, and if in maybe plain old rigidity language, you're interested in whether the boundary vertices are also in equilibrium, essentially, in your in your drawing. And yeah. If they are, then I guess you'll you'll have a flat. You'll have a lifting where sort of that polygonal boundary just stays flat. Is this? Yes. Because right. if that's true, uh, then you have a complete polyhedron, okay, uh, with every face flat. And, and oh, one of Maxwell's incredibly observations in his 1864 that if uh, that any projection of a plain face polyhedron is a um, is a projection of a of a, of a two dimensional structure with uh, that's in equilibrium, but without any external loads, and, and so. Um, so if, if you have a two-dimensional structure, which is an equilibrium um, uh, against itself, but there's forces on them on all the members, and it then if you if you if those nodes are moved to the in the z direction, they can take vertical load. Um, okay. The um, uh, I mean, so the thing is, can I ask about you're showing this picture? Mm -hmm. Bring it back. Uh, okay. I mean, so so the one on the left. Essentially, nothing is stressed except this like wheel graph in the middle. Yep. And and basically, Which, like in it, in in the lifting, in fact, nothing else lifts as far as I can tell. They just lift flat. Yep. And 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 you have like a little pyramid sitting in the yes. little garden. Which right? is so so. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so the one on the right, like the outside, is a projection of a rectangular prism of some type. It's a Schlegel diagram, or you know, whatever you want to call yep. it. And so, so then, in fact, what you have is like a little cube, you know, with the pyramid sitting on top of it. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, OK. And, and you, one could imagine that um, if this were kind of more central, it would be pretty happy for most load cases, like a uniform load. It would be all resisted, actually. It's, it's like a pyramid on, on these like four stilts, these four inclined stilts um, in, the, in the third dimension. And, and so it, it, that, that's the load case it can take. Those are other load cases it can't take without bending. The one on the oh, left okay. is, even though it has one state of cell stress, it's not a very happy one because even though I, I can carry loads from the, the node in the middle to the four nodes just around the middle, I can't carry it to the outside square without just um, by axial loads. I have to do, because I can't develop any axial forces, I have to carry it by bending, which is very expensive. Are we okay. have so isn't this also related to the question of whether the outside vertices are pinned or not? If they're pinned, there might be a yeah, yeah. that goes to the outside. If you're not pinned, yeah. which you could do for the thing on the right, then you're happy. Is yes. that right? Yeah, to, to make the one on the left work, I have to pin it, which means that it's essentially saying I have to thrust against my adjacent building. Yeah. But even if you don't do pinning. If your load isn't the kind that is resolved axially, it's a bad load, then it still will kick, right? No, you, you can resist it by bending within the roof uh, or, or you kick, you have the two choices. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 Shlomo, you could have the two choices. You could either um, kick against the, prim the, the, um, the pretend like you're, you have a bridge between two mountains. You, know, you could either t have a tide arch or you can push against the mountains. Uh, and in this case, if, if you could push against uh, a building, uh, you know, the surrounding building, you could then essentially uh, create another state of self stress uh, that, that would allow that to happen. Yeah, I agree. Also, the, the uh, question about the axial forces, it seems to me if you have an external load that is not resolved by one of these internal forces, isn't it sort of, it's, it's uh, you, you have this, uh, if you think of it as made of glass, each of the, uh, the facets yeah. made of glass, it's like you're trying to break the glass. Yeah, and that's yeah. not very nice. <laughs> right, right. What will happen is these, these quadrilaterals will start to distort. Yes, uh, that's right. And, and um, so the idea is not to have so many 
forces that will do that kind of bending. Right. Uh, yeah, uh, one of the earlier talks, you know, I mean, if we did like that art piece or was in the earlier talk, you know, if we if we come up with a really good uh, structural glass that doesn't break, maybe we can uh, <laughs> we can we can go to that 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 uh, that world uh, that Walter has of the uh, of of where you have the panels uh, for your story. Are are you uh, are you happy or unhappy about? Uh, let's say you have quad faces, but uh, but. Uh, loops within loops, you have circles within circles, like uh, uh, quadrilaterals within quadrilaterals, but each of the quadrilaterals have further quadrilaterals on the inside. Is that good or bad? Would you be happy with that kind of design? That, that could be, uh, it'll, it'll turn into an aesthetic question. Uh, you know, that uh, does it, because uh, uh, one could imagine um, a, um, uh, you know, a series of like, you know, subsystems, like a little, looks like a bunch of, uh, like a, a, a plant, a bunch of plants next to each other, a bunch of little, um, you know, you know um, uh, 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 subsystems that are all together. And whether or not it looks interesting. Um, it, it was uh, just a kind of a barely related topic. I don't know if you all know this, but uh, one of the original designs for the Guggenheim Museum in New York by Frank Lloyd Wright, was where it has that little dome, that, that little spherical dome. He actually tried to, um, additional design was to tile it with circles. And, and, and uh, there was a, uh, we had a conversation a couple of days ago about uh, tiling a sphere with circles. So Frank Lloyd Wright tried that, but in the end he, he went to the, went a different direction. But, uh, but you know, let's say you had a bunch of these, like if you tile this thing with a bunch of substructures that link together, I mean, that's, that's a solution worth knowing. And then it comes down to an aesthetic question. Huh. Yeah. But it is an interesting idea. So, so I wanna maybe ask you about one other thing that you asked about just to make sure I, I got it. So, so you sort of have, so one thing about like these stacking type constructions is that they generate like localized stresses. Uh, they can right. if they, they, they can, you yeah. know, unless right. you I mean, which is, that's what happens on the right in your picture. I like your picture. It's a good reference. So, so you've got like this localized stress that lives on the center, even if you took a rest, took away the rest. Yes, yes, yes. And then you've got this like second stress, which is also essentially localized onto the, the cube, as it were. Yeah, it's in the, it's in the space between the two squares. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. So, so I'm, I guess, okay. So, so is that okay for you, or do you find it desirable that the, the stresses that you find actually kind of have large supports? Uh, it's barely, uh, the one on the right's barely acceptable. We'll live, we'll, we'll, we'll okay. live with it, uh, yeah. but uh, it would be better if we could, uh, um, uh, you know, pick up more states of cell stress and more, uh, you know, uh, in this particular roof, if my loads are in the right place, I'm very happy. But if I had a bunch of snow on, on one half of it, on the right half, I'm pretty unhappy. Uh, I, I've got to muscle it. It's, yeah, if you've got big, these concentric sort of rings like this, your loads that are, will be just axial will be sort of concentric loads as well. So if you want to have anti-symmetric loads, then it's, yeah. it's not so good. But typically the main load case is a sort of uniform load and your secondary load case will be an anti-symmetric load of some sort. Yeah, you know, I mean, um, what, what, what Cam is, you know, uh, talking about is um, the, um, let me see if I can get this right. Uh, you know, you know, one could of course do nested rectangles We call this kind of like a little wedding cake. But then you get very long and very short members, right? Isn't that something right. you want to avoid? Yeah, you want to avoid, so because you you know you're gonna, you're gonna have to like divide all this up into a bunch of other stuff in order to um, glaze it, and and they're not really doing any good. They're not they're not part of the system. They're just uh, they're just laying in there. Won't it be that uh, no matter how clever you are with your constraints? 
there will be lots of stresses that yes. uh, lots of forces you can't resolve, right? Yes, but but, but the more states of cell stress, the fewer there are. Uh, if I have a, uh, and this is actually in Maxwell's paper of 1870, if I have a triangular mesh, yes, <laughs> the, the number of states of cell stress is equal to the number of internal nodes. And if I'm supported on the perimeter, I can take any load case. Yeah, sure. Uh, but, uh, but uh, the, you know, the problem, you know, uh, the problem with the great court roof is it cost a fortune. <laughs> uh, uh, you know, every time you, um, uh, you know, every time you, you have a, a triangular piece of glass, you just threw half the glass away. Um, I mean, triangulations are great for having cell stresses, right? Because you're, yep. as you exceed two and minus three by like an awful lot, then you're picking up like loads and loads of, of nice equilibrium stresses. Yeah, that, that's, that's true, but no one can afford the roof. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you. This has been super helpful to understand the, the problem. So. I think it's for me, I, I, it's kind of a, a fascinating uh, question. It's like, um, how many can you, could you have? If somebody gave you a graph, could you in your world tell us, you know, well, if you put the nodes in the right spot, I can give you so many cents uh, and, sh and you're not going to shrink it to a point or something. <laughs> uh, you know, you, you can, I can count up this many edges and nodes and how I haven't had this many nodes that are valence four and these many nodes are valence five or, and, and you say, okay, there somewhere out there are seven states of cell stress, go find them, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I think that's, a, that's a real, that's a real problem for us. That's, a, that'd be a very helpful to us. First of all, yeah, how many you, are there, then, then how to find them. As you guys have picked up on, there's sort of two bits to this, right? There's maximizing the number of states of cell stress because that gives us the largest size of, uh, largest space of funicular loads or axial only loads. But you're right. We also want to design them so that they are reasonable lifts so that there are dominant load cases. But this is a sort of problem that um, falls more outside of what you guys normally look at we feel mm -hmm. so yeah, it's, it's, it's it's about and, and you know and when you when you go back to to the maxwell count um uh, you, you know it's um uh, you know sometimes uh, it's like the anti-rigidity uh, question uh you know uh, can, can you maximize the number of mechanisms for me because that gives me more states of cell stress yeah uh, yeah so, so, and and I think this is for me. This is really quite fascinating. Uh, uh, this is the um, I, I, from a structural point of view. The, the, on the say the left is the structure, and the right is the forces. Uh, but it's also a machine on the right. And if I can move those nodes around, so I have lots of flexes in this thing, I'll pick up a bunch of states of cell stress on the left. Um, and, and so, how many how many mechanisms can this guy on the left have? Um, you know, to increase the number of states of cell stress. I mean, mechanisms can I put in the rights to increase the number of states of cell stress on the left. And, and this duality is really quite remarkable. And the other duality is actually, believe it or not, you know, think about it. The one on the right could be the structure and the left could be the forces. Uh, yeah. You actually get two structures. Uh, and, and actually both structures have exactly the same internal energy because the, the uh, one of them is the length of the member, the other is the length of the force. So if I take the length of each bar, uh, if I for each bar I take the length of, of both diagrams, multiply them together and add them all up, I have the same internal energy for both structures. Okay. So I, I hope I've, I've made, I, I've, I've uh, uh, maybe, uh, uh, made uh, some interesting topic for someone to look at uh, in your world. It would be very helpful in my world.